So here we are continuing to work down our code. You can see that we have a new data file to read in. Press abc.csv. So now there are three response categories, preferences for A, B, and C. And we'll follow a similar pattern that we did before. So having read in the file, we'll view it. And you can see that we have subject in the left and preferences in the right. And now there are not just A's and B's, but also C's. So there's a new website alternative introduced. From a study design point of view, we'd have to think about if that was introduced at the end uh, of the, the subject seeing the other two alternatives, might that not cause an, an order effect because it always came last? Uh, for our purposes, maybe we assume we're, we're, we're testing over uh, a new set of 60 participants, and so they haven't seen the other two before. Go ahead and close that. We're going to recode the subject column for good practice uh, again as a categorical factor. And we can take as well a summary of the data. And we can see now that our summary has eight preferences for website A, uh, even less than before, uh, 21 for B, and 31 for C. In a sense, we might think that C came in and sort of siphoned off preference from A and, and B and became possibly the new popular one. But the statistical question is, is 31 preferences for C statistically significant uh, with respect to 21 for B? Uh, obviously, they're both quite a bit more than, than A, and that might be meaningful enough to us just on the face of it. So again, we create a, um, a cross-tabulation, a table that tells us um, the preferences. And these tables get more interesting when, uh, when we have uh, more than one sample. Right? So we can see, again, A, B, and C are in our table there. And then we run a chi-square test again. We can see here the result. Um, is now has two degrees of freedom, not just one, uh, because we have three response categories. And so the degrees of freedom for a chi-squared test of this kind are the number of response categories uh, minus one. We can also see our p-value is indeed significantly less than 0 0.05. Here I've added the chi-squared test result for our, our three response category data, prefs A, B, C. We can see we have chi-squared, as I mentioned, we have two degrees of freedom now. We have still 60 measures, 60 cases. Uh, the chi-squared statistic was 13.3, and uh, gives us a p-value that's less than 0 0.01. So that's how we'd report that second result. And you can extrapolate from here for reporting uh, all the chi-squared tests that you may do. So that's our uh, uh, asymptotic test. Uh, the multinomial test that I mentioned is an exact test, and for that we're going to need to load in the exnomial library. Let's do that. And the x multifunction gives us a test over um, a set of probabilities here. Uh, we're testing over the, the preferences we have. Uh, the, the, the c function uh, just creates a list, so we can pass in a list of values that are the the probabilities if there were no preference, and that would be a third of respondents would be for each category, A, B, and C. Right? If there was no preference for any of the websites, we'd expect a third of the people to like each of them. And then uh, this function has various ways to, to calculate the probability, uh, and that comes through stat name. Um, incidentally, if you like to look up information about any function, a very useful thing in RStudio is to type a question mark and then the function you're interested in. So uh, let's say we didn't know what that stat name um, uh, parameter meant and we wanted to see more. We could type question mark x multi. And we can see here, I know that uh, on your screen the font may be pretty small, but it's a help page that gives us all the information about, uh, about this function and its parameters. So that's a great way to always learn more. You'll find that you're doing that often. I certainly am. So, uh, let's go ahead and execute the x multi function, the uh, multinomial distribution uh, test, multinomial test. And we can see it gives us a p-value that's an exact p-value, uh, also quite a bit less than 0 0.05. So uh, again, we'd expect a difference uh, given those proportions. Now what that tells us is there is a difference between some levels, uh, uh, some numbers of a, b, and c. It doesn't actually tell us 
what the difference is between A and B, B and C, or A and C. Those pairwise differences are what are called post hoc tests or post hoc pairwise comparisons. They're post hoc in the sense that they follow a statistically significant overall or what's called omnibus test. We just did that omnibus test with uh, the multinomial test with X multi. If we want to know about the comparison of these separate differences, well, then we can go ahead and uh, run post hoc binomial tests. Uh, binomial again in the sense that now we're just back to uh, testing each of them against a hypothesized probability. Uh, so for example, we can see in this line a test uh, of uh, level A against uh, a hypothesized probability of one-third. So uh, if we had, what this test is showing is we were summing over the, um, the rows that have a preference for A comparing those against all of the rows in the table and comparing that against what would be a, a chance probability of a third. And we're doing that for all A, B, and C levels to see which ones are significantly different from chance. So we're going to store all those results in A, A, B, B, and C, C. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, do what's called an adjustment and report the results. Now this adjustment needs a little explanation. When we're testing statistical um, tests, uh, there's, and we say that there's a, uh, if p is less than 0.05, there's a significant result. Uh, that means that there's a, a 1 in 20 chance uh, that just by chance we might think there's a statistical, uh, statistically significant outcome when in fact it's, it's just by chance. That's what being at 0.05 means. Uh, a 1 in 20 chance for that. And so if we're doing what are multiple comparisons, if we were to do 20 of them, we'd expect one just by chance to become significant. So we have to adjust for that, and we do that with a, a, a Bonferroni correction. This method here is called HOLM, which is really the preferred one. It subsumes Bonferroni, but it's a, a little bit less of a, of a strict test. Uh, it's a sequential test that adjusts each of the p-values according to, to just how low it is. Uh, the first p-value is, is, in this case, with three tests divided by three, the, the, uh, or sorry, multiplied by three, so increased three times. The second is doubled, and the, the, the highest one is left as is. If at any point uh, one of those is not less than 0.05, then that sequence stops. This is called home sequential Bonferroni procedure. So the bottom line is, anytime we're doing multiple tests, we want to correct in this fashion. And we can see now that uh, we have a significant result for, for A. It's significantly different from uh, chance from a third. People didn't like it. It had only eight preferences. Uh, uh, the preference for B was 21, which is near uh, chance. And then the preference for C uh, was 31, uh, which is more than half the participants. Of course, 21 is almost a third of 60. So that tells us if they're significantly different from, from chance for those individual ones. And we see A was lower and, and C was higher. OK, let's go ahead and go back now to our analysis table to see what we've covered. In that second row, we've covered one sample test with two response, greater than two response categories, in this case three. We saw both the one sample chi-square test again and the multinomial test with those pairwise contrasts uh, after the fact. Now we can ask, what happens if we have more than one sample? What happens if we have a, a couple ways in which our participants are sampled, maybe for their preferences, but also, say, for their sex, male or female? We could ask, is there a difference in what males prefer to, to what females prefer with respect to these, uh, these website preferences that we're testing?